So shalom again. This is Reverend John Ferret, and we're in part two of lesson 28 on Exodus chapter 10. This section is going to be going from verse 10 through the end of the chapter. Now, we ended off in part one with the fact that Dennis Prager, who is a Hebrew expert, I mean, he speaks Hebrew fluently. And he goes into the Hebrew of verse 10 and shows us an amazing alternative equivalent translation. Now first, let's again read that verse, verse 10. Then he said to them, Thus may the Lord be with you. If ever I let you and your little ones go, take heed, for evil is in your mind. So first, we take a look at some comments from Dr. John Kareed's excellent Torah commentary when he says this that Pharaoh's rejoinder is bitter and condescending the sense of it is a denial of the existence of Yahweh and his being with his people the king exclaims that the only evidence that such a deity is real will be if Pharaoh releases all the Hebrew people. This is what he says. Now, he's, in other words, when we go back to verse 10, not only Dennis Prager, but Dr. John Carreter are saying, you got to read this sarcastically. So in verse 10 from the New American Standard, so Pharaoh said to them, thus may the Lord be with you if, if, if ever I let your little ones go, then the Lord will be with you. The implication then in that sentence is the Lord exists, yeah. <laughs> the Lord is real, yeah. If I had let your people go, then your God wins. But he proclaims that he will do no such thing. In the end, the deliverance of the Israelites proves Pharaoh's words to be true. Pharaoh is speaking the truth and he doesn't even know it because the God of Israel is with them because he's going to finally let them go. But coming back to the Hebrew, in the New American Standard it says, take heed for evil is in your mind. Now the Hebrew there is ki racha neged panechem. Ki racha neged panechem. One way of reading that in the Hebrew is that evil is in front of your face. I mean, that's literal. In other words, it means that Moses is planning to do something bad, something evil, something against Pharaoh. That evil is in front of your face. But this gets really interesting. The main god of Egypt in 1446 B.C. is Ra. That's also the Hebrew word for evil Ra so could it be that we're, we're, we're reading this in verse 10 that Pharaoh is really saying take heed for Ra is preventing you from leaving Egypt that Ra is against your face the supreme god of Egypt that's amazing. The equivalent alternative makes more sense. It shows the state of Pharaoh's mind. Ra is holding you back. Not that there's some sort of evil that Moses is doing. Now you could read it that way. But understanding the Egyptian culture in 1446 BC, what is Pharaoh trying to tell Moses? Ra, the supreme god of Egypt is against you. It shows the state of Pharaoh's mind that he still is holding on to the power of his gods. His faith, which is faith and fantasy and demons. Pharaoh's warned. Moses and Aaron are driven out of the palace, but they warned them. They, they, and, and the locust infestation came. It was like no other infestation before or after. I remember 
when I was in Egypt on a Bible study tour and our leader bless his heart he actually had us climb the eastern slopes of the mountain that overlooks the Valley of the Kings this is, this is not a hill this is a pretty high mountain now we didn't go all the way up probably two thirds of the way up it was 120 degrees that day I'll never forget it we're going up at 2 in the afternoon now we're on the eastern slopes of this mountain on the western side of the Nile which means by the time we got up to two thirds of that height of that mountain we were able to look east and we could see the Nile Valley below us and what's very fascinating is and you can see this from space that when you look at Egypt going from the Nile Delta all the way down to Africa it's a thin green line that's all it is it's it and it's just totally amazing especially when you're walking in the green areas in the green fields and all of a sudden the green field ends and you are in the desert so the locusts coming upon Egypt to eat everything and wipe out the green makes sense it doesn't make sense in the United States not like we read here it makes sense in Egypt because of the geography and again knowing the geography you say wait a minute this is really a possibility so Egypt's economy is totally devastated so let's go back into the Bible and read the last verses of this chapter starting in Exodus 11 through the end of the chapter not so go now the men among you and serve the Lord for that is what you desire so they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence then the Lord said to Moses stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts that they may come up on the land of Egypt and eat every plant of the land even all the all that the hail has left so Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt and the Lord directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night and when it was morning the east wind brought the locusts the locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled in all the territory of Egypt they were very numerous they had never there had never been so many locusts nor would there ever be so many again for they covered the surface of the whole land so that the land was darkened and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees and the, that the hail had left thus nothing green was left on on tree or plant of the field through all the land of egypt ladies and gentlemen that means the wheat harvest was destroyed the wheat may have been one maybe two inches tall at that time not destroyed by the hail but now it's gone their economy devastated then pharaoh hurriedly called for moses and aaron and he said i've sinned against the lord your god and against you now therefore please forgive my sin only this once and make supplication to the Lord your God that he would only remove this death from me he went out from Pharaoh and made supplication to the Lord so the Lord shifted the wind to a very strong west wind which took up the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea and actually in the Hebrew it drove them into the Reed Sea not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the sons of Israel go now in our study we're going to stop here in verse 20 I thought we were going to finish chapter 10 we'll have to do that next time so everything's gone Th this reminds me and many of you maybe feel the same way when we've experienced a couple of significant stock market crashes can we imagine an ultimate stock market crash where the United States has ruined its entire economy that money is worthless can you imagine the panic and the anxiety now in these verses Pharaoh says I've sinned against the Lord and Moses and he's not admitting he's a sinner he didn't say that he said I sinned against the Lord and Moses 
The Hebrew word there is ka'ata, which means missing the mark. It's been translated into English as, as sin. I'd rather go back and take a look at the verse and read it from the ancient Hebrew. <coughs> Then Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron, and he said, I have done something against what you, Moses, and your God intended. Missing the mark, missing the target. Missing the target of what God had intended. In other words, Pharaoh wouldn't grant what the God of Moses and Moses wanted. He's not, he, he didn't sin. He, it, it's, in God's view, in Moses' view, Pharaoh sinned. But not in the view of Ma'at. Once again, I thank Dennis Prager for an amazing insight at this point. Right here on 1016, where it talks about, I stand, I have sinned against the Lord your God and before you Moses Prager states Pharaoh's statement that he sinned before Moses as God highlights a radical difference between biblical monotheism and other worldviews this is why I'm teaching Torah for Christians nobody does this and this is God's truth this is God's instruction that's what Torah means it's for us today monotheists hold that's us there is a single moral god of the universe which means there's a single moral code before whom we sin and can repent Poly polytheists such as pharaoh however believed a person could sin before one god while doing nothing wrong in the eyes of another god Though Pharaoh recognizes he has sinned before Moses as God, he cannot be truly contrite and repent because he does not believe he has done anything objectively wrong. This is Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, when he conquered the world, he spread Hellenism. He was the world's greatest missionary. Hellenism is religion. It's worldview. It's a polytheistic religion of, of, of pagan gods. And as part of Hellenism is moral relativism. In other words, Alexander the Great and Socrates, who trained Alexander, and Plato would say, your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth. And we can accept them both. That's moral relativism. It was in Pharaoh's day, it was in the day of Alexander the Great, and guess what? It continues on today. Moral relativism has permeated the church. Don't thank Alexander the Great. Don't thank Pharaoh. This is a part of us. So Pharaoh, he doesn't believe in objective morality. He thinks in terms of power. It's similar to the uh, similar to the fifth century B.C. Athenians who destroyed the Melians during the Peloponnesian War. <clears throat> Though Melos did them no wrong, the strong do what they have the power to do, and the weak accept what they have to accept. Pharaoh sees that Moses' is God is prevailing over him, and concludes he must have done something offensive in the eyes of this God not in the eyes of Ma'at or Amun-Ra or Osiris. It was right after this, Moses left, didn't even respond to Pharaoh, just walked out. And again, this is, method, this, this is Pharaoh's method to beat the Lord. It's very subtle. He did it before, and he seems to be doing it again. 
Pharaoh comes and cries to Moses, Oh, help us, Moses. This plague is awful. These flies are terrible. Oh, the frogs are awful. This hail, oh my gosh. I've sinned against God and I, I have sinned against you. Not a sinner as per Ma'at and his gods. But he has gone against the God of Moses and a God who Pharaoh didn't recognize. So every time it seems like Pharaoh comes out and he seems to be sorry, he seems to be so, he's so devastated by the plague, but it's a ruse. I think Pharaoh gets it. It's Pharaoh's ploy to stop Adonai. And we read this in Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7, the 13 attributes of God. Compassionate, merciful, slow to anger. Our God, the only God, the true God, a God of mercy and compassion and loving kindness, he stops the plague. He ends the disaster. The hail, now the locusts, and all the plagues before. Pharaoh thinks he won! It's a sinister way to think that he defeated Yahweh, that he defeated the God over all people, all nations, the God of the universe. Moses walking out the way he did implies that Moses may have looked upon it in this way. He gets it. Pharaoh's not repenting. He's doing what he did before. Now, the plague ends, and we note something very interesting. God blows them away with a westerly wind. But he brought them with an easterly wind. So they come on the wind, an easterly wind, and a westerly wind blows them into the Sea of Reeds. Could it be that Pharaoh might look upon this and say, this isn't God's power. This is just bad luck. That's a freak of nature. It just happened to be timed perfectly. Many skeptics today agree that the plagues, they're not miracles. They're just bad luck. They're freaks, freak storms or freak events in nature. But remember, the nine plagues, one through nine, are in triads. There's an order, there's a plan. God engineers them according to a specific plan. Oh yeah, the east wind brought them, the west wind took them away. So it seems probable that it's not convincing proof for Pharaoh. But his staff, the advisors, the department heads, the cabinet of ancient Egypt, the magicians... Back in verse 7 in this chapter, they clearly saw this as the power of God. Remember this in the plague of the gnats. Plague number 3. This was in Exodus 8, verse 19. This is the finger of God. It was at that time that the magicians, the advisors, his staff turned against Pharaoh and said, No, this is God. All Egyptian was convinced, but not Pharaoh. He's all alone. No one supports his actions anymore. He's isolated. His commitment to Ma'at and the demon gods he worshipped was amazingly strong. Verse 20, we read, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go. Hardened. No, he didn't harden his heart. Remember, it's his mind again. The word there is Kazakh. Strong's number, 2388. God gave him courage. Courage? Courage to take a stand? To, to keep taking the stand as he is? Courage to keep this up? Perhaps. But I say perhaps not. Again. Perhaps our God, a loving God, a patient God, merciful, God who, in his word, shows us that he loves the whole world and all of us, Jew and Gentile alike, calls Egyptian his pe the Egyptians his people. 
Perhaps he's giving courage now to Pharaoh to stop this craziness before it goes too far. We know the end of the story. God will kill Pharaoh's son and all the firstborn in Egypt. It's finally going to come home. It's going to hit him and his family. Could it be that Adonai preferred not to do any of this? Could it be that our God is giving Pharaoh one chance after another to change his mind? Pharaoh seems to be a picture of all of us. Because we see nothing changed. I'm going to go to Alexander the Great. Nothing changed even in our day today. Many churches today would talk about moral relativism. There are many Christians today, many, who say there are multiple ways to God. In Genesis 6, 5, probably one of the key verses in the entire Bible. Key verses because it sets a foundation for God's redemption plan, the whole Bible. So Genesis 6, 5 is huge when it says, God is basically saying, The intention of man's heart is to do evil continually. He was so sad to have given mankind free will. So sad that he would destroy all mankind. Don't think too harshly of Pharaoh. He's just like us. I remember the verse in John chapter 8, verses 31 through 32, where Jesus is saying to abide or continue in his word. And when you actually take the English to the Greek and the Greek to the Hebrew, the implication of the Hebrew is live your day persevere in this life which has good times and bad times which has blessings and curses endure life in his word relying on his word holding onto it like it was the staffish of a shepherd so that you will know the truth I just consider 60 million babies have been murdered in the United States since Roe versus Wade through abortion. 60 million. And we know his word. Reading it in the New American Standard, Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil. A false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. The Hebrew word for innocent is naki. <coughs> Strong's number is 5355. And it gives the picture of somebody free of guilt clean totally clean it, it can't be adults you guys physically it can only be children it can only be babies and it only could be the unborn these are the ones who are free of guilt especially the little ones who have not come to the full knowledge of sin we see how god may have given the evil Pharaoh, all he needed to cease, all he needed to stop, to free Israel, to turn his back on Moab. Is God doing the same to us today? But just like Pharaoh, 
who one plague after another would not listen. Today, no one seems to be listening. No one. No one seems to fear El Elyon, God Most High. Not the government. Not many Christians, not the church. The murder and shedding of innocent blood goes on. It doesn't cease. God hates this. And we ask, when, O Lord? Until when, Father? God hammered Egypt. He destroyed their gods. Destroyed, seemingly, the unification of their social structure. When the advisors and the magicians and so on were shown to be powerless, destroyed their economy. Is this our future in the United States? For us, we know he's the same then. He's the same now and he's the same forever. Malachi 3.6 God says he does not change. And perhaps the plagues and us studying the wrath of God that fell upon Egypt and we're not even to the 10th plague. And here we're trying to abide and continue in his word. Is this a warning? Is this possibly a warning also to say there are future plagues coming? Future disasters coming designed and engineered by God himself to bring his wrath upon all nations? Could it be that says that God is saying, look at Egypt. Because just like I did this to one country, so will I do this to the entire world. As we come to the book of Revelation. Could it be? I wouldn't be surprised. Shalom. <laughs>